Okay, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Welcome to the York Region Invasive Species webinar. I want to thank you all for taking the time today to join us to learn a little bit about invasive species. Uh, so to introduce myself, my name is Lauren Bell. I'm the Education and Community Outreach Coordinator at the Invasive Species Center, and I've been at the center since 2016. Uh, so today, to avoid any technical uh, hiccups, we're going to be uh, self-monitoring myself today on the webinar. So throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, just leave them for me in the chat box or the question section on the right-hand side of the GoToWebinar platform. Um, today's webinar is being recorded, so if you have any questions uh, after the fact or you want to rewatch the webinar, it will be available online as well. And I'd like to, before we get started, just thank York Region for making this webinar possible for us today. So if you're not familiar with the Invasive Species Center, we are a not-for-profit organization and we're located in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. In the last nine years, the Invasive Species Center has grown into a respected collaborator, a knowledge broker, and a partner a leader in invasive species research and action in Ontario and beyond. We are a bridging organization, so we like to bridge research, research end users, and bringing knowledge to action. So as you can see, the mission for the Invasive Species Center is we connect stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent and reduce the spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. So today we're going to talk about some of the ways that you can get involved to stop the spread of invasive species in your communities here in Ontario. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the citizen science program that I run through the Invasive Species Center. I'm going to discuss some of the priority plant examples in York Region, as well as two insects of concern in York Region as well. And then we're going to discuss some of the actions that you can take to help reduce the spread of invasive species, including how and why to report in your communities. And then we're going to have some time for questions at the end. But feel free to put your questions in throughout the presentation. So let's start off with what is EDRR. So EDRR stands for the Early Detection and Rapid Response Network of Ontario. This is the program that I manage through the Invasive Species Center. And it is a citizen science initiative, which we'll get into a little bit what that means um, in a second. So what is it? It's a citizen science network that's aimed at training citizens how to detect, report when appropriate, and respond to invasive species in Ontario. It's this act as eyes on the ground approach to stopping the spread of new introductions and further spread of invasive species throughout Ontario. And it starts with community members just like you. And it's all about slowing the spread of invasive species one community at a time. So the program started in 2015, thanks to funding from the Ontario Trillium Foundation. And to date, we've engaged with over 16,000 people across Ontario. The program has over 693 volunteers, and these volunteers have contributed to over 2,300 hours of on-the-ground action managing invasive species throughout Ontario. So we're pretty proud of these numbers. The program is currently established in five major areas across the province, including our newest area of Sudbury. And this is all thanks to the Ontario Trillium Foundation and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry um, and the Ontario Trillium Foundation's GROW grant that wrapped up this August of 2019. So these milestones were met through collaboration with lots of partners, including our key partners at the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. And so this graphic here is our model for establishing EDRR into new communities. It's what we've used in the last five communities that we've moved into. And so this is our goal of the whole program is to create a network of trained volunteers and citizen scientists that can champion invasive species initiatives in their communities. And this includes you, including people working in their own backyards. And so becoming a trained volunteer or a member of the network can include anything from taking the steps to attend a workshop in your area, attending info nights or invasive species events in your area, attending a webinar just like this, hosting a stewardship removal event. For example, we host a lot of garlic mustard pulls and we have a lot of partners that host garlic mustard pulls. Um, it's a good stewardship opportunity. 
Um, hosting things like that in your community through partnership with the network are some good examples of how to get involved. And I'll talk a little bit more at the end about how to get involved. And so I've kind of talked a little bit about what we do on a general scale, but a little bit more specific about what kind of things that we do with the EDRR program. We do training on identification and reporting. So this includes priority species that will alter between communities. So the species that we cover for York Region will be different than what we cover for Thunder Bay, for example. Social media campaigns to help raise awareness. So this is often in partnership with our other organizations and partners. We disseminate resources and information to stewardship groups. This is probably one of the biggest things that we do is send out resources and information for people hosting events or holding booths, for example, or just those citizens that are interested in learning a little bit more. We do invasive species identification as well as management strategies for the public. We do assistance in planning stewardship removals with communities, like for example, the garlic mustard poles that I mentioned. I'll get into that a little bit later. As well, we host training workshops in different communities across Ontario. So some of the examples of some of the events that we've done in the past include our Sudbury Youth Summit, which we held two years ago. We do training for Ontario park staff. We do aquatic invasive species workshops. We do plant workshops, as well as our most, uh, one of our most recent events was hosting a hemlock woolly adelgid training session in the field in Niagara region. And I'll talk about that a bit later too. So you can keep up to date with some of our initiatives and opportunities on our website there, edrrontario.ca. This EDRR website is part of the Family of Invasive Species Center website. Um, and so you can get connected to our other websites through there as well. And our Twitter as well is another good opportunity if you use Twitter as a way to stay up to date on some of the opportunities that are available if someone's interested in taking part in the network. And I'll get a little, a little into it a little bit more later on. So we've used the term citizen science quite a bit throughout this webinar, um, and it's sometimes referred to as community science as well. But what does it mean? So the actual definition for citizen science you can see here. So it's defined as the collection and analysis of data related to the natural world by means of the gen world by members of the general public typically as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. So that last part's really important. So in this case, the data pertains to invasive species distribution throughout Ontario, and it's done in collaboration with us at the Invasive Species Center and with our Invasive Species Center partners. So EDRR focuses on both citizen science and data collection, but also the, that other side of the coin is stewardship management. So citizen science, is really about community participation. And that's where everyone on this webinar comes in. So this is a really big growing field of citizen science. Maybe you've heard it in other opportunities. NASA uses citizen science for things such as Cloud Watch or Mosquito Watch. Um, so it's not just an invasive species center initiative. By any means, citizen science is found in all realms of science. And so it's used as a tool for reporting and managing invasive species, and this is how the EDRR network is using it. So it has a high importance in, in uh, the world of science as funding can be limited, and this scientific field relies on that community science in order to assist with important data collection, which we'll talk a little bit about how you can help assist at the end of the webinar. So it's this idea that anyone out uh, participating in the scientific community does it through an organization such as, in this case, the EDRR network, or if it was outside of invasive species, it would be with another network. And it's everyone, citizens, industry professionals, community groups, acting as those eyes on the ground, reporting and responding to, again, when it's appropriate, invasive species within their communities. And it's really this idea that citizens are reporting to that provincial database. So we've clarified what citizen science is and how that relates to invasive species, but what are invasive species? So an invasive species, you can see here on the graphic, it's considered invasive when it's introduced into an ecosystem outside of its native range, and it has potential impacts on the ecology, the economy, or society in that introduced range. But it's important to note here that for a species to be considered invasive, 
it must have that second component. It can't simply be a species introduced outside of its native range. That's what we would refer to as a non-native species. It has to have that second component, which sometimes we refer to as the harm. So it has to have that potential impact or that potential harm on one or all three of those four ca or three categories, ecology, economy, or society. And typically, it usually does harm all three. And we'll get into some examples when we get into some of the species. And so some of the, these characteristic traits of invasive species can include fast growing and reproducing, a lack of natural predators in the environment, and that doesn't slow their spread, and a lack of def defense mechanisms in the actual native host species itself. So these are just a couple examples. But again, you can see here, it can't stop at non-native to the environment. It has to go further than that. It has to have those uh, impacts that cause harm. So to put invasive species into an Ontario context, unfortunately, we are number one. Ontario has a large population, and a lot of it is located in a small area. And so with many ports of entry, it makes accidental introduction risks really high for things like invasive pests, plants, and aquatic species. So just to read out some of these stats, there's over 440 known invasive plant species in southern Ontario. 39 known or potential invasive insects or forest insects, about 10 invasive tree diseases that are known, and around 180 non-native and invasive species in the Great Lakes. So this graph here depicts the invasion curve. If you're not familiar with the invasion curve, it illustrates the feasibility of eradicating an invasive species over time. So the feasibility of that eradication decreases as time goes on to the point where it can no longer be possible to fully control that species. And so where you see this red circle is where we focus on at the Early Detection and Rapid Response Network program. And so this is at or before the species arrival. And that could be arrival into Canada as a whole, it could be arrival into Ontario, or it could be further spread throughout your community. So we're at all, we're at all different uh, levels of introduction when we talk about species arrival. And detecting early is important in every aspect of that, whether it's important to detect early for your community or early to detect, important to detect early for the country as a whole. So early detection kind of is important throughout all of those, uh, all of those stages. And so the earlier a species is detected, the better. Controlling invasive species before they become established in an area does help reduce its impact on those three pillars we talked about. So, and including things like human health, biodiversity, the economy, and society. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the priority plant examples in York Region. It's really important to note that this is not by any means a definitive list, but rather some examples that we've pulled together to keep an eye out for in your community. So you'll notice that as I go on, I'm not going to be covering management of invasive species in this webinar for time uh, reasons, but I'm going to highlight some of the key management resources you can find at the end. And that's also a common, common uh, service we provide at the Invasive Species Center is management information. So you'll have my email at the end if you have any specific management questions. So we're going to start off with one that maybe some people have, have unfortunately seen, uh, maybe in their own yards, but we're going to be talking about Japanese knotweed. And so Japanese knotweed is native to Eastern Asia. It's originally planted as an ornamental species, and it was actually used to stabilize riverbanks and prevent erosion because of its root system. So some of the key ID features you're going to look for for Japanese knotweed include these alternating large lobed leaves on the stem there that you can see in the bottom left photo. It also has a spray of white flowers later in the growing season, which we'll see in the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, it was used as a stabilizing plant because of its root system. The root system of a Japanese knotweed plant can grow up to five meters deep, so very, very deep. It's actually a very tall plant as well. That's myself there in the top right corner, um, and that plant uh, it can typically be around two to three meters tall. So a lot of the time it's been nicknamed in the past the iceberg plant because what you see above the soil 
is actually only a fraction of the true size of the plant. So it's a pretty monstrous plant. It can withstand shade, high heat, high salinity, and lots of drought. So it's pretty resilient, as with most of the species we'll be talking about today. The seeds of this plant actually rarely germinate. It spreads mainly by the rhizome, so that underground stem, and from the nodes at the pieces of green stem, and it'll spread in soil or in water. So it's a pretty hardy plant. Sometimes it's commonly confused as, as a bamboo because it has a hollow stem, just like bamboo. So in Ontario, the Invasive Species Act sets out rules to protect and control invasive species in the province. And in Ontario, Japanese knotweed is classified as restricted under this act. This is an act specific to Ontario, so it's not restricted in Canada as a whole. There are 16 other species that are found under the Invasive Species Act, and they're looking to add more. And this is mandated by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. So it is listed as rest restricted, and as you can see here, the formal definition, meaning in Ontario, it's illegal to import, deposit, release, breed, grow, buy, sell, lease, or trade a restricted invasive species. And a large emphasis of this is put on to stopping the spread throughout Ontario parks. So in the beginning, I mentioned that a species introduced outside of its native range must have those harm impacts to the economy, the society, or, econo or ecology, and most of them harm all three. So as I go through these species, you're gonna see the same kind of three headers throughout, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about those impacts. So the impacts to Japanese knotweed under the economic pillar are, it is very expensive to control, and it's pretty long-term to control and it can break through concrete and damage infrastructure. In that top right photo, you'll see a young Japanese knotweed, sometimes referred to as asparagus shoots because their appearance is similar to asparagus. It's a good way to remember what they look like. And you can see that it's breaking through the asphalt there. So it's got a really, really strong stem. And there on the left-hand side, you can see those white sprays of kind of whitish, greenish flowers. And though that picture in, on the left there was taken around August in Sault Ste. Marie. So these strong stems are one of the reasons why it has such a high economic impact. Um, but some of the societal impacts, it can take over an area, meaning it can take over public parks and trails. Here in Sault Ste. Marie, we do see it take over walking trails, making it hard to get through the area. It, it forms a, a, a thick bush, and when you try to walk through, the, even the dead stems will stay up throughout the winter, so it can be pretty messy. Some of the ecological impacts are it outcompetes native species, it reproduces from these minute little rhizomes, that underground stem section, and it degrades wildlife habitats. So this is a distribution map. I'll be talking a little bit about where it's from and what it means uh, at the end of the webinar, but this is our known populations that have been reported, so it's not a definitive list. If you don't see it uh, located in your community, it does not, on this map, it does not mean that it's not there. I will talk a little bit about that at the end, but these are the known reported distributions throughout uh, the York Region area, and it is found throughout all of Ontario, so all the way from southern to northern Ontario, Japanese knotweed is found. It's commonly found along riverbanks, fences, and along homes as well. The next species we're going to talk about is dog strangling vine. So this refers to two plants within the milkweed family. Uh, they're also known as black swallowwort and pale swallowwort, but both of these varieties are native to Eurasia. So we're going to be focusing on the pale swallowwort, but they're actually so similar that they share a common name. So they're both referred to as dog strangling vine. So this is also a restricted species under the Invasive Species Act, similar to Japanese Maui. It can grow to be typically about one to two meters high. And it actually does outcompete the native ground covers as well, including strangling of young plants and trees. So the plant has these oval leaves with a pointed tip. You can see there it's typically about 7 to 12 centimeters long on the bottom right. It has a star-shaped pink to purple flower and about 4 to centimeter long bean pods, uh, bean-shaped seed pods, which you can see in the top right there. You can see the familiarity with the milkweed family. And these beans pods, seed pods can uh, produce about 28,000 seeds per square meter. 
So pretty heavy infestation. So some of the impacts of dog strangling vine include the economic side closures to public parks and walking areas. It forms dense, thick mats on the ground, and so there's a huge issue there with walking and health hazards, and it can be fairly costly to remove. Some societal impacts are it can create tripping hazards, like I mentioned. So for people and pets, it can be quite a worrisome health hazard. And it can take over these wild areas. On the left bottom photo there is where in Ottawa, actually. And you can see just dense, dense thicket of this dog strangling vine could be a huge health issue, especially if you were, for example, a hydro worker working in a back area. It could be really hard to get through there if there was no designated trail. Some of the ecological impacts are it strangles out young saplings and it can outcompete native ground cover. A really important ecological impact is the reduction of the monarch butterfly population. Perhaps you're familiar with um, the reduction in populations over the past decade. The adult butterflies, they confuse dog strangling vine for native milkweeds and they'll lay their eggs on the underside of the leaf of the dog strangling vine, but the larva cannot complete their life cycle and they will end up dying. So the leaves, and that's a huge impact for obviously the, the population. And, and we think that they confuse them likely because of uh, the resemblance and the fact that they're part of the milkweed family as well. Another issue is the leaves and the roots of the plant can also be toxic to deer and other livestock, but it is worth mentioning that grazing animals do typically avoid this plant. The seedlings, you can see in this middle photo, the seedlings do grow straight up and erect and they don't twine. So you can see here that it looks quite different than the adult vine on the left-hand side. So this is the distribution in York Region, and these are again from citizen reports. And they're typically found along roadsides, ditches, fields, railroads, and trails. It spreads primarily by human, but it can also spread by wind. The seeds will spread by wind. So our last plant is typically the most well-known, um, due mainly to its kind of notorious harm and its media coverage, most likely. Um, so wild parsnip is a perennial plant. It's a member of the carrot family that's native to Europe and Asia. And it was likely brought over by European settlers. So there is the cultivated form of parsnip, which maybe we're more familiar with. The type that we're talking about is the wild variety of the plant, and they like they believe that it likely escaped from the cultivated plants when it was brought over initially. So wild parsnip can grow to a height of about 0.5 to 1.5 meters. It has a small yellow five-petaled flower that you can see in that left photo. And it grows in clusters, and those flowers will bloom typically in Ontario from June till about October. Pretty long bloom. So here you can see the whole plant with the yellow uh, flower head on top there and the alternating leaves, which are about 15 centimeters in length. So some of the notoriety that the wild parsnip receives is due in large to its societal human health harm that it causes. And so both the wild and the cultivated forms of parsnip contain toxic compounds. And so this can cause rashes, burns, blisters when it's exposed to the sunlight, when, when the sap that you touch is exposed to the sunlight. And this is referred to as photodermatitis. And so we would refer to this plant as phototoxic when it has a sap that reacts to UV light when it's on the skin. So you can see the photos here below, the effects of photodermatitis can last over six months, so it's pretty painful and something that should definitely be avoided. The roots of wild parsnip, again, that's the non-cultivated form, can also contain these compounds, so it's not recommended that you eat wild parsnip roots. And again, that's a different variety than the normal parsnip that we're used to in our kitchen. So it's, it's really recommended that you avoid all contact with this plant. Um, the UV reactive sap can be very dangerous. If you ever think you've come into contact with it, the most important first step to do is to cover the exposed area from the sunlight. So if you have anything that can cover the skin while you go to get a place to wash it with soap and water and remove the clothing and put it directly into the wash is the first steps you should take. So some of the economic impacts of this species 
is it can be time intensive to control like a lot of invasive plants as well as fairly costly. It can take over an area including public parks and trails and fields. Um, and of course, there's the human health impact from that phototoxic sap. Some of the ecological impacts are it outcompetes native species and it can deter pollinators. Honeybees are not attracted to this species and so therefore it can displace other pollinators that are friendly for, for uh, other pollinator plants, excuse me, that are friendly plants such as goldenrod. And so if the honeybees aren't in the area pollinating, other native species that rely on that pollination can be displaced. And so this is the distribution reports for wild parsnip in the York Region area. Um, so it's found along roadside ditches, railroads, edges of fields and water courses, pretty similar to the other species. It does prefer sunny disturbed areas and doesn't thrive in flooded areas, um, but a lot of invasive species can survive in a lot of uh, areas. They're very good at being generalists. So that's it for the invasive plants for this for this webinar. Next, we're going to move on to two invasive insects of high concern, and both have not been currently detected in York Region. And again, these are just some examples. These aren't a definitive list of invasive species of concern. So we're going to start with maybe one we've heard about, especially if we're, if we're living in kind of the GTA area. Um, so the Asian longhorn beetle. It's an invasive forest pest. This is it here on the left-hand side. And it's believed to have come from Canada on woodpacking crates. It is native to China and the Korean Peninsula. It attacks and kills different types of hardwood trees, poplars, birches, willows, and most important for Canada and culturally important is the maple tree. So native beetles can easily be confused with Asian longhorn beetle, especially the white spotted sawyer beetle, which you see on the right hand side here. Sometimes these, these are referred to as pine bugs. So these native sawyer beetles are a lot smaller and they only feed on the stressed, dying or cut conifers like pine trees, for example. So Asian longhorn beetle is different because it does not attack conifers as well. It has some other different uh, lookalike so for example, you can see here the banded antenna, that white and black striped antenna is one of the key ID features. It has several large randomly scattered dots you can see on the back there, as well as these white, sometimes bluish feet on the bottom there. And so the, another main difference between the two is that while the Sawyer beetle attacks stressed or dying trees, the Asian longhorn beetle targets all deciduous trees. So it has no preference for dying or, or stressed trees. It will attack healthy trees as well. So signs of an infestation can include oval shaped egg, egg pits that are dug onto the trunk branches or the roots. And this looks like a shallow scraping on the bark. It can also include leaking sap from the tree, large round exit holes, which you can see here on the right hand side. This exit hole is made when the adult emerges and the adult will typically emerge in the summer and feed on the twigs and the leaves on the tree and then lay their eggs and those eggs will hatch about two weeks later. Another, uh, other signs include premature leaf drop and yellowing of leaves, which you can see in the left-hand photo there, as well as branch dieback. So the leaves will actually completely die off of one single branch and some, we refer to that as branch flagging, kind of the tree's way to let you know that something's happening with, within the tree. Other kind of signs of, of infestation can include increased woodpecker activity. The woodpeckers can smell the larva underneath the bark and they'll start pecking away at the tree, similar to what we've seen with emerald ash borer infestations. And so a lot of increased woodpecker activity can be a good sign as well. So these large exit holes, they will impede the tree's ability to take up nutrients. And one tree can have hundreds of exit holes, like you can see on the left-hand side here. So these, these exit holes will form typically around May to July. And when those beetles lay those eggs, like I mentioned, and the eggs will hatch within about two weeks, they'll, an adult will typically lay up to 80 eggs. The beetle can fly. It can fly around 365 meters approximately, um, but their spread is completely dependent on the availability of host trees around, so those hardwoods around. Some of the impacts of Asian longhorn beetles 
Of course, there's a huge economic impact we can see right away. There's a huge loss for the forestry sector as well for the maple syrup industry, which I'll talk about on the next slide. There's impacts to the tourism industry as well. Fall colors is a huge draw for a lot of areas, especially in the Eastern Ontario. And so this is a huge loss to those companies or to those areas in the event that Asian longhorn beetle was to establish. As well, it can be very costly to manage, which we'll talk a little bit about as well. Some of the societal impacts are loss of culturally important trees like the maple tree and the loss of some ecological impacts as well can be the loss of the important tree canopy, loss of habitat for birds and mammals. So in 2014, it was estimated that the Government of Canada had spent about $35.5 million preventing the spread and establishment of Asian longhorn beetle in the country. And to kind of put that into some context, it seems like a lot of money, of course, but as of 2017, it was estimated that Canada's maple syrup industry alone, so excluding the forestry industry on tourism in this case, the maple syrup industry alone is worth around $494 million to Canada. So that's a, it's a, a lot of money to be putting into prevention and kind of the beginning steps of that invasion curve, but the, out, the result of what can be saved um, is huge as well. So important to know. So the establishment of Asian longhorn beetle in Canada would be detrimental to this industry. And, and this is just one example of an industry. Um, and so therefore that early detection and eyes on the ground was essential to stopping the spread, which we'll talk about in a second. So Asian longhorn beetle does have a, a peppered history in Ontario. Um, it was first discovered in 20, 2003 in an industrial area north of Toronto. About 150 kilometer squared quarantine zone was established and that meant the removal of about 12,000, uh, over 12,000 trees. And those included both trees that were infested with Asian longhorn beetle and those that were really high risk. So I mentioned that the beetle can fly and it needs those host trees, those food sources in order to spread. So those trees were removed as to limit the risk. And so from about 2007 to 2013, no signs of the beetle had returned until December 2013 when a second population was found. It was identified as Asian longhorn beetle in the area of Mississauga in about August. And those trees were removed, more trees, and a new regulated area was established, which exists today. So this area continues to be heavily monitored. It's believed to be eradicated because no new infestations have been found, but it is still being monitored. So it's important here to note that it's not currently found in Ontario. And that is thanks entirely to the early detection and rapid response of a lot of key players, including the Canadian Food Inspections Agency and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. So this eradication effort did not come without a, a large price. It, thousands of tr private trees and public lands, trees were removed to help limit the beetle's food source. And so it's a really good case study for early detection and rapid response for sure. So the next species we're gonna move on to is our, our next insect. So maybe you're familiar with this species in the news and maybe you're not. Uh, but hemlock woolly adelgid, which is the insect featured here, is a non-native aphid-like insect. So that aphid-like means that it sucks fluid from plants. And so this insect is extremely small. It's less than 1.5 millimeters in size, as you can see in the bottom there. It creates this waxy woolly egg sac that kind of looks like the tip of a Q-tip which you can see throughout the photos here, and it produces that on the underside of the hemlock tree. Because it's an aphid, it, it attaches to the branch and it, at the base of the needles, and it sucks the nutrients and the sap from the tree. And so feeding causes this dieback of twigs and as well as bud death, needle loss, and the tree will eventually die. So these egg sacs, as I mentioned, these kind of cotton ball looking, they're found on that underside of the branch. And the wool can also be found on the trunk of the tree, as well as on broken trees on the ground or just on the ground in general. So it's important to look kind of all around the hemlock tree for signs of hemlock woolly adelgid. All sizes and all ages of hemlock trees can be found. This insect is native to East Asia and British Columbia. However, it's really important to note 
that the eastern and the western province uh, populations in North America are genetically dif distant. So that's really important. In the west, it feeds on western hemlock, and this causes almost no damage due to resistance in the western hemlock tree. However, in the east, which is the population that we're talking about here, it targets eastern and Carolinia hemlock, which have no host resistance at all. So it's really a huge impact to the hemlock trees here because they don't, these trees don't have a host resistance like they do out west. And it's important to note that the two populations are genetically different. So this species can spread naturally by wind, birds, and mammals, but it can also spread accidentally through movement of nursery stock and human movement. And so some of the economic impacts of this species include while hemlock is not as high value as some other trees economically, it is commonly used for construction and pulp. So a loss to this species would be a loss to uh, those industries, which is fairly significant here in Canada. And some societal impacts, this tree is very commonly planted as an ornamental tree. And so there's huge aesthetic losses, especially to homeowners if they lose their hemlock trees. The ecological impacts here is, is probably the highest of all three. It's a loss for nesting and migrating birds and animals. As well, it impacts the nitrogen cycle and the health of organisms. So hemlock trees are commonly found along rivers. It helps moderate that stream water temperature, and it does help stabilize the soil, especially in steep gorges. So in the summer, it helps keep the water cool. In the winter, it helps keep the water warmer. And so loss of those trees around those areas is going to change how those systems work. And so the loss of a hemlock tree, which is a foundational species, it opens up the area for invasive species that thrive in disturbed systems. So for example, like the dog strangling vine we talked about, which thrives in disturbed systems. As with most invasive species, the loss and opening of a canopy is going to cause other species to come in and thrive in that area where the native species may not be able to in those open environments anymore. So the history and kind of distribution of hemlock lily adelgid is interesting here in Ontario. And it's a timely time to be having uh, a discussion about hemlock lily adelgid because in May of 2019, it was detected in a natural area in Niagara Falls and a second population in Wayne Fleet, Ontario. So still in the Niagara region. And this was as a direct result of the, hem of the uh, hemlock lily adelgid delimitation surveys that are done by the Canadian Food Inspections Agency. So, when this was found, a notice of prohibition of movement was placed on these areas, and so no movement of uh, wood products or anything can come out of these areas because it's known that an invasive species is present. And a collaborative long-term su uh, suppression strategy for these sites is being developed by the CFIA, the Canadian Food Inspections Agency. This is a really good example of early detection being a key step in slowing the movement Right now, we have we know its boundary. We know that it's found in the Niagara region, but it's not currently found in York region. And so it's really important to have citizens acting as eyes on the ground to make sure that if this species does happen to be detected in the area, that it's really early detected so that it stays on that eradication as possible uh, section of the invasion curve. And so some of the key signs you can look for are those woolly egg sacs on the underside of the tree at the base of the needles. and But it's important to note that sometimes these egg sacs can be confused with spider nests, spider egg sacs, um, as well as remnants of the spittle bug. And so if you think you've seen it, it's always good to report it uh, because you just never know. But there are sometimes species um, that make egg sacs or, or leave behind things that look similar to a hemlock lily adelgid. So other things to look for are premature needle loss on your hemlock trees or thinning and graying of that tree canopy, similar to Asian longhorn beetle, dibrack of branches, or early discoloration that is untimely for the season. So if it's in middle of summer and you're seeing dieback um, of any kind of deciduous tree is always a key sign, but it can be a little bit harder for conifers. And so looking for discoloration um, is a key sign. Um, if, I will note here, if you are interested in learning more about hemlock lily adelgid, the biology and the history in Canada, this is obviously a really quick summary and it's a lot more in depth. 
Um, but we did do a webinar back in November with Erin Appleton from the Canadian Food Inspections Agency, and that is available on our Invasive Species Center YouTube page. Um, and so if you're interested in learning more about Haemophilia delgid, I recommend checking out the webinar. So what can you do to help protect hemlock trees in York Region? Since we know that there is a risk of spread in Southern Ontario, the first step is to avoid placing bird feeders near hemlocks. The species can hitchhike on the birds, and so it's important to make sure that you're not assisting in that hitchhiking uh, through planting or uh, putting bird feeders too close to these hemlock trees, which are high risk. Um, this spring, also be sure to keep an eye out for any known hemlock trees in your community for signs of those egg sacs. Spring is the best time to look for those sacs, um, as this is when those uh, hemlock lily delgid will lay their eggs and when those sacs will appear. And the last is to always make sure that you're only buying firewood sourced from local forests and not to move firewood out of your area. So outside of those kind of hemlock specific uh, things that you can do, there's a lot of other ways that you can help reduce the spread of invasive species. And it starts with the pathways of spread. So if you are an avid angler or someone that enjoys fishing, uh, making sure that you're not dumping your bait within 30 meters of the shoreline or disposing of it in a proper way is really important to slowing the spread of aquatic invasive species. Making sure that you're keep cleaning your boots and outdoor gear as to not bring any pests or pathogens back home with you. Cleaning your boot at the trailhead, um, using something as simple as a nail brush, throwing it in your backpack when you're out hiking is a really good way to stop the spread of invasive uh, plants, pests, and pathogens. Buying local firewood and burning local firewood, which we mentioned, and not transporting firewood over long distances as well as invasive species can be introduced through our gardens. And so making sure that we're choosing native species to plant in our gardens over those invasive or potentially invasive species. So invasive species are the second leading cause of biodiversity loss worldwide, and that's only after habitat loss or habitat destruction. And so preventing accidental spread through your everyday actions is one essential way to protecting that biodiversity. And so these are just some of the simple ways that you can do it in your everyday activities especially in the summer coming as we're going to be maybe getting outside a little bit more, it's important to make those kind of conscious decisions to help stop the spread of invasive species. So another really, really important action and what we're going to focus on for the, the remainder of the webinar here is that reporting sightings of invasive species to the early detection and distribution mapping system, which you see here. So this is a really popular invasive species reporting platform here in North America. And here in Ontario, it's coordinated by the Invading Species Awareness Program, which is a program run by the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. Um, this reporting tool is available as both a website, which you can see the website link there, or an application. I believe it's only unavailable on Blackberries, but it's available for iPhones and Androids. And so we're going to get into a little bit about why to report how and kind of some of the cool things that are featured in this platform. So EdMaps Ontario, it's the idea of you see it and you map it. It's a distribution mapping system that was initially launched in 2005 by the Center for Ecosystem Health at the University of Georgia. It combines data with other databases and organizations as well as volunteer observations, which is what we're talking about today, to create this national network of invasive species distribution data. And this data is shared with educators, land managers, conservation biologists, and, and anyone that's interested. So it's freely available. The document, uh, sorry, this data is found, it's, it's meant to become a foundation for a better understanding of where this distribution is. So you can even see here, just in this webinar as an example, I used several of the maps that I pulled from EdMaps. So it's really important on an educational tool, and we'll talk about some of the other reasons why it's important in a minute. The data is immediately uploaded to the website and it allows for real-time tracking of invasive species. And so being able to see the current data sets of where it's moving and where species are popping up around Ontario and beyond is really important for early detection and rapid response. We, we can't help if we don't know where it is or we can't, it's important for us to know those leading edges. 
And so all the data is reviewed by verifiers. Every uh, area is different, especially throughout the United States, but here in Ontario, it's verified by uh, the experts at the Invading Species Awareness Program. Um, and then that's to ensure that that data is accurate. So citizen science is, is very important and it's a huge growing field and it's really reliant on having accurate, um, trustworthy data. And so that's where the verifiers come in. So once this data is confirmed, it's made freely available to all users. So all you do is simply create a free account and it will always be free. Um, create this account and off you go. So you don't have to have any knowledge of that GIS background. Um, it's really, really user friendly. So let's get into how it works. So you make an observation. You enter that information into your EdMaps profile, which you can create online. You can either create it right from your phone or you can create it on the website. That data is immediately loaded into the database. It's either confirmed or not confirmed uh, by the data reviewers at the, at, in this case, ISAP. That data is then, if it's confirmed, it's then freely available to all users to see. And on your My EdMaps account, you can actually see your past reports. You can see new, uh, new detections that are coming up in your area. You can set alerts for species that you're really concerned about. For example, if you wanted to know if there was wild parsnip uh, being found in your area. And you can actually look up through different queries, for example, if you wanted to learn about species in your municipal boundary. So you can see that you can actually visualize the data on those maps and some of the maps I featured earlier on in the distribution section. And so these distribution maps are only as accurate as the number of reports that are being sent in, and they rely on members of the community to be sending them in for verification. So we can't know what's in every community if the communities aren't reporting these species. So the reports can be used to select sites for management and outreach, increase local knowledge of distribution, identify new infestations and those leading edges, like I mentioned, understanding the movement of invasive species over time, they have the potential to influence policy, and they can enact a response plan for those high priority species. Because that's one of the questions we get quite a bit is why should I report? And so as I mentioned, when you submit a report, it's reviewed by verifiers at the Invading Species Awareness Program, and this is located there in Peterborough, Ontario. And so how it works is the timelines will vary Priority is given to those high-risk species. So for example, those priority species include those not currently known in Ontario, like Asian longhorn beetle, for example, or species that are currently established in Ontario but have been reported outside of their known distribution, such as hemlock woolly adelgid. And depending on what species you're reporting, it could lead to a response from different levels of government if you're reporting a really high priority species, such as Asian carp, for example. So to make an observation on your phone or computer, you only need four things. You need to know the date in which you saw it, the general habitat in which you saw it, the location which you can pinpoint on the map provided, as well as photos for verification. So when taking photos, it's important to focus on areas that will be important for the verifiers. So for example, if it's a plant, you would focus on the leaves, the stem, and if there were any flowers present. And you can upload quite a few uh, photos. So it's important to note that EdMaps isn't just for reporting species. Each species has its own information page. You can see here, this is an example of the garlic mustard page. It's cut off, but at the bottom there would be photos for identification. So it's kind of like having your own pocket reference guide with you if you're taking it on your phone application. So we also really encourage that you look up what's being reported in your area. You can search through those queries, like I mentioned, the top of the website says queries and you can click on it and you can see what's being reported in your area to give you a better idea of what species you should be on the lookout for or if there's a new introduction. So if you're interested in ways that you can report outside of EdMaps, uh, you can actually call the Invading Species Awareness Hotline, which the phone number is there. Or you can call the Ontario branch of the Canadian Food Inspections Agency. Now, it may seem a bit odd to call the Canadian Food Inspections Agency, but I'm going to talk about kind of their role, which is a very large role here um, in Canada in a second. And it should also be noted that you can also submit observations on iNaturalist, which I know a lot of people use. 
Um, and that data is collected and added to the Ontario Invading Species Awareness's iNaturalist project. So in Canada, the Canadian Food Inspections Agency is responsible for plant pests as they pertain to food and plants in the country. And so it's important that if you do become aware of a plant pest that's not previously known to exist in the area, you must report it to CFIA. And there you have the information below. I understand we're, we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm just going a little quick. But if you ever have a question or want to know how to report to CFIA, you can just contact my email at the end of the webinar and I can send this information as well. But you just send by email and you do your name, address, phone number, and email contact information. Photographs of the pest if possible, a description of some of the signs and symptoms, as well as a general location if you're able to provide it. And so there's a lot of different resources that you can access if you're interested in learning more about invasive species and kind of what's being done in this realm. Our website is one of the family of websites of the Invasive Species Center, so you can find it there at the bottom left. And so some of our most popular features are downloadable resources pages and events calendars where we feature ours and other people's events. So if you have a stewardship event in your community that's related to Invasive Species Center, Take note of my email and send it along because we always like to feature different events happening around Ontario or wider. Um, and so this is also a preview of our, our newly to be promoted uh, Invasive Species Center website. Um, InvasiveSpeciesCenter.ca is a great place to look for things like species profiles, our policy pages, our risk assessment database is really popular and we have a lot of other features. So I recommend um, taking a look there if you're looking to learn a little bit more. You can also check out our news page on our EDRR website. And so here we have some interesting blog posts. I get a lot of requests on how to manage a lot of different species. And by far the most popular is how to manage garlic mustard. And so just last week I published our newest blog post, how to remove garlic mustard. Um, so if you are interested in keeping up to date with some of our blog posts, check out our website on the news page. And you can find other blog posts that we do throughout the year there as well. So in this webinar, I didn't focus on management for time reasons, uh, but there are a lot of tools available to help guide management because I know it's, a, it's an issue that people are trying to figure out how to manage some of these invasive species. And so these are some of the examples of the best management documents that are available. All of these are available digitally on a number of different websites. I've listed some of them there, but if you Google the title of the management document you're interested in, for example, dog strangling vine best management practices, um, you'll find it on a lot of different platforms. These 14 landowner technical bulletins here on the right-hand side were developed by EDRR. Um, and these are an updated and condensed version of the best management practices for invasive plants. So we have 14 of them currently, and we're hoping to have more in the future. And these are also available online on the EDRR website. So if you're interested in learning more about invasive species initiatives, news, or events, you can sign up to become a member. Again, this is on our website, and if you had any issues finding it, just shoot me an email. You can sign up to receive event and webinar invitations, ISC newsletter, as well as our bi-weekly media scans that we send out. These are some of our social medias that we have. So you can follow us on social media, including our Twitter, our Facebook, our Instagram, and our LinkedIn. And so a lot of the time we're posting content relative to events or, or the season. For example, right now we're going to be doing a lot of gardening and kind of spring-themed content. And so if you're interested in that, please follow along and, and hopefully there's something of, of interest there. I'm also excited to announce that this year we'll be hosting a new webinar series. It'll feature invasive species experts and a new topic each month. So our first webinar is titled Controlling the Spread of European Water Chestnut and Parrot Feather in Ontario. And the guest speaker is Kyle Boroman from Ducks Unlimited. If you're interested in registering for this, you can go to the invasivespeciescenter.ca website to register. And we will be hosting more webinars all throughout 2020. So take a look um, and sign up to join our network if you're interested in keeping up to date with those. So in summary, I just wanted to conclude that citizen science and, and reducing the movement of invasive species, it depends on community members and it depends on you. 
people of the community. So while you're out in York Region and you're enjoying nature, it might not be your main reason for being outside. It, it might not be to detect invasive species, but with these tools and this knowledge kind of in your back pocket, to look to report, to know the signs and symptoms of invasive species, you can help protect these outdoor spaces that matter to you most while just being out in nature. And it's as easy as taking a photo. And so with that, I'm gonna conclude. That brings us to the end of the presentation. We have about five minutes left for questions. Um, you can submit them into the chat box on the right-hand side. And also remember, if you'd like to submit your question after or by email, um, my contact information is right there, lbell at invasivespeciescenter.ca. Um, as well, it's also available on the edrrontario.ca website as well, if you're interested. Um, Dana Laxton, the Invasive Species Specialist at York Region, is going to be joining us for the last five minutes for some questions. If you have a specific York Region question, she's also available to answer those as well. I'm just going to move over to the chat box. So the first question that we've gotten is, will there be a recorded seminar be available to watch again later? And the answer is yes, the, the webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Invasive Species Center YouTube page. Um, so if you just go on YouTube and write Invasive Species Center, you'll see our, our channel and our list of videos featured there. It should be up tomorrow. Just letting some of the last questions come in. So the next question is, what happens after I report a sighting of invasive species using EDMAPS Ontario? While it's true that not every single report will result in an action, I listed some of the reasons why it's important to report because in the long term, it can be a, a really important part of a larger picture. Uh, while yes, not every single one will result in action, if you were to report one of the priority species, then it would mean that you would be able to um, potentially incite um, a management response from the Canadian Food Inspections Agency if it was a species that was regulated. Or for example, if you reported Asian carp in one of the Great Lakes, it would result in a, in a response from them. These high priority species are the ones that usually typically result in um, responses. Next question I have is, what are some of the best ways to get others involved that may not be so environmentally inclined to care about issues of invasive species? I'm a fish and wildlife conservation student, soon to be grad, and trying to engage the community. I find that with our events, a lot of the time, the most important part is making a really strong call to action and, and making sure that the reason for people to be there is very clear. What are you contributing to the environment? Now, if they're not so environmentally inclined, there's a lot of other reasons to contribute. For example, if you're one that enjoys going for walks or going for bikes, we've seen closures of trails because of invasive species introduction. Economic factors are also really important too. The loss of jobs, the loss of um, ability to combat these invasive species and, and the loss economically to industries such as forestry industry when invasive species come in can be huge like we've seen with, for example, mountain pine beetle out in the West. Um, and so I think the takeaway is making sure that you create a really strong call to action and kind of, there's a lot of different factors that go into invasive species and why you should care. Um, and if environmental maybe isn't the strongest, there's those two other pillars as well, the economic side and the societal side as well. There's a lot of questions coming in, so I will say we definitely don't have enough time to answer all of them as we're just about at 3 o'clock now. Um, but I have a, a record of all the questions that have come in, and so I'm going to uh, compare those with the emails I have, and I'll be sure to answer everyone's question following the webinar. So with that, uh, I want to thank everyone so much uh, for all of your questions. Um, and yeah, just look out for my email as I answer them kind of one by one. But I also would just like to take this second to thank Dana and everyone at York Region for allowing us to do this webinar and, and helping us make this possible. 
Um, and I'd like to thank everyone here for tuning in today and, and taking some time out of your day to learn a little bit more about the Invasive Species Center and what we're doing here. And I would like everyone to have a, a great rest of their day. Thank you so much for joining.